Section 72 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 6, 1910 through 1919. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. July 2, 1917. To sell Mark Twain home. Humorist's daughter finds Connecticut place too isolated. Stormfield, Mark Twain's old home near Redding, Connecticut, in which the humorist died, has been advertised for sale. He built it with the idea of getting a country home which should be near enough to New York, and yet not too near in summer and winter. But his daughter, Mrs. Clara Clemens Gabrilovich, to whom it passed after his death, found it too far away for the needs of an artist whose affairs required frequent presence in the metropolis. She and her husband, Osip Gabrilovich, lived in it intermittently until 1914, but since then they have spent their summers at Seal Harbor, Maine, and most of the winter seasons in New York. The house, built on 248 acres, acquired by Mr. Clemens, stands on a hilltop in the section where General Israel Putnam raised his troops in the Revolution. It embodies a good many of the humorist's own ideas of architecture. The house was built in 1907, but the humorist did not find the happiness he expected there. His daughter Jean, who had lived with him for many years, was drowned in her bath at Stormfield on Christmas Eve 1909 as a result of an epileptic stroke, and Mark Twain was still suffering from grief over her death when he died on April 21st following. End of section 72, July 2, 1917, To Sell Mark Twain Home Read by John Greenman Section 73 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 6, 1910-1919. through 1919. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. September 9, 1917. Latest Works of Fiction. Jap Heron. Jap Heron, a novel written from the Ouija board, with an introduction on the coming of Jap Heron. Frontispiece Portrait, New York, Mitchell Kennerly. One dollar fifty cents. The Ouija board seems to have come to stay as a competitor of the typewriter in the production of fiction, for this is the third novel in the last few months that has claimed the authorship of some dead and gone being who, unwilling to give up human activities, has appeared to find in the Ouija board a material means of expression. This last story is unequivocal in its claim of origin for those who are responsible for it appear to be convinced beyond doubt that no less a spirit than that of Mark Twain guided their hands as the story was spelled out on the board. Emily Grant Hutchings and Lola V. Hayes are the sponsors of the tale, Mrs. Hayes being the passive recipient whose hands upon the pointer were especially necessary. St. Louis is the scene of the exploit, as it is also of the literary labors of that Ouija board that writes the Patience Worth stories. Emily Grant Hutchings, who writes the introductory account of how it all happened, is from Hannibal, Missouri, the home of Mark Twain's boyhood, and in her the alleged spirit of the author seems to have put much confidence. Her long description of how the story was written and of the many conversations they had with Mark Twain through the Ouija board contains many quotations of his remarks that sometimes have a reminiscent flavor of the humorous characteristic conversation. The story itself, a long novelette, is seen in a Missouri town and tells how a lad born to poverty and shiftlessness by the help of a fine-souled and high-minded man and woman grew into a noble and useful manhood and helped to regenerate his town. There is evident a rather striking knowledge of the conditions of life and the peculiarities of character in a Missouri town. The dialect is true, and the picture has, in general, many features that will seem familiar to those who know their Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. A country paper fills an important place in the tale, and there is constant proof of familiarity with the life and work of the editor of such a sheet. The humor impresses as a feeble attempt at imitation, and, while there is now and then a strong, sure touch of pathos or a swift and true revelation of human nature, the sob stuff, 
that oozes through many of the scenes and the overdrawn emotions are too much for credulity if this is the best that mark twain can do by reaching across the barrier the army of admirers that his works have won for him will all hope that he will hereafter respect that boundary end of section seventy three september ninth nineteen seventeen latest works of fiction jap heron read by john greenman section seventy four of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman november eighteenth nineteen seventeen mark twain as a letter writer two volumes of hitherto unpublished correspondence full of delightful self-revelations and noble friendships by brander matthews Mark Twain's Letters, arranged with comment by Albert Bigelow Payne, two volumes, illustrated, New York, Harper and Brothers. Five years ago, Mr. Albert Bigelow Payne published his monumental life of Mark Twain, one of the very best of modern biographies, solidly authenticated by laborious research, immitigably honest, setting down naught in malice, instinct with the desire to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth in that book he made constant use of mark twain's correspondence selecting judiciously and quoting from the letters not so much for their own sake as to illuminate characteristics of his subject now he has collected two solid volumes of mark twain's correspondence which he has arranged chronologically and which he has elucidated by a running commentary always modest always unobtrusive and always confined to the strictly necessary explanations in other words he has let mark twain the letter writer speak for himself it is difficult to see how this work could have been done more discreetly or more tactfully mark twain in spite of his abiding boyishness which was continually tempting him into exuberant outbreaks had an unusual gift for friendships and these two volumes are a record of noble and enduring friendships it is true that he had permanent disagreements with bret hart and edward h house and john t raymond but he bound howells and h h rogers to him with hooks of steel and his association with aldridge and twichell warner and gilder charles warren stoddard and george w cable was almost as intimate and as unclouded the sympathy between goethe and schiller or that between carlyle and emerson was not finer or more beautiful than that between mark twain and howells in these volumes mr paine has given us two or three score of mark's letters to howells and only a scant half dozen of howells letters to mark we want them all and it is to be hoped that their correspondence will be printed in full and by itself sooner or later mark twain was a marvelous talker and he was also a marvelous letter writer because he wrote letters as if he were merely talking to the friend from whom he chanced to be separated these letters are never composed with any thought of publication they are never labored they are always easy they are sometimes even free and easy they are the spontaneous expression of the man himself as he happened to be at the moment of taking pen in hand in the shortest of them as in the longest he is unmistakably himself setting down in black and white his thoughts and his feelings as they surged up naturally and assured that the recipient would supply the understanding needed for their complete appreciation they are highly individual they abound in whim in humorous exaggeration in imagination and in energy they are delightful reading in themselves in the first place and in the second as revelations of the character and the characteristics of mr samuel l clemens who was in some ways a different person from mr mark twain known to all the world of course the earlier letters written in his boyhood and youth to his mother his sister and his brother are what might be expected in the correspondence of a fledgling author who ripened slowly and who did not discover himself and come into his own until he was thirty indeed most of these missives of his immaturity are not only flavorless but quite without any promise of the later mastery of the accomplished man of letters 
which their writer was to become. Only in the course of years did he acquire the command of style, the nervous directness, the pungent vitality, the instinct for the unerring adjective and for the inevitable noun, which became his in the course of time, and which revealed itself first in the unforgettable description of the Sphinx in The Innocents Abroad, to be matched later by the superb account of the Jungfrau in A Tramp Abroad. Those belated readers who may even now think of Mark Twain as a mere fun-maker, to be classed carelessly with John Phoenix and Artemis Ward and Josh Billings, will find in these letters cause to revise hasty judgment and to recognize the depth and nobility of Mark Twain's nature. A humorist he was from the beginning to the end, but at the end humor was no longer the dominant element in his work. He made men laugh as no one else was able to do so abundantly in the final two score years of the nineteenth century, but his laughter was never forced or trivial or accidental. His humor was rooted in and flowered out of a deep and abiding melancholy, and at the end of his life he was as serious and as sad at heart as Swift or Cervantes or Moliere. His tenderness is beautifully displayed in the letters to his wife, of which Mr. Paine allows us to read only a few, simple and sincere in their direct expression of a love which began at first sight and which grew steadily with the years. As these years passed, he was stricken again and again. His only son was taken from him in infancy. Then his eldest daughter died, and what her loss meant to him can be seen from a letter, page 641, to Mr. Twitchell, in which he laid his heart bare before his friend. Then Mrs. Clemens was snatched away at last, after protracted periods of hopeless invalidism. Finally his youngest daughter died in her turn, and there is unspeakable pathos in the letter he then wrote to his sole surviving child, page 835. It is only on occasion and to the members of his own family that the deeper aspects of the man are disclosed. For the most part the letters deal with surface of life and with the experiences of the moment. Many of them have a reckless and joyous exaggeration, as in that which he wrote to Mr. Twitchell, page 666, and which was called forth by an article of mine, one paragraph in this, expressing violently his distaste for the ivory miniatures of Jane Austen, was so vehement that Mr. Paine has decorously edited out the most picturesque of its phrases. But its purport can be guessed at from another paragraph in another letter, in which he expresses his wonder why the contemporaries of Jane Austen allowed her to die a natural death. Mr. Paine prints without any editing two similar but less vehement letters to me, written after Mark had been reading several of Scott's novels with increasing dissatisfaction, relieved only after he had come to Quentin Durward, and after he had found that bravura romance more to his liking. These two letters, pages 737 and 8, are very like the article he wrote on Fenimore Cooper's Literary Offenses, and in these letters and in that article he reveals his critical insight, his fundamental honesty, which was continually compelling him to read the accredited authors of the past with his own spectacles and to apply his own standards of judgment. He has no reverence for a classic which cannot prove its right to be received as a classic, but while he has the insight of a true critic, he lacks the balance that true criticism demands. Most of the blemishes he dwells on in the stories of Scott and Cooper are there for all to see, yet there are counterbalancing beauties which Mark failed to perceive, or at least to acknowledge. Here again he discloses his eternal boyishness, so to call it, which is one of his most marked characteristics. A great part of the merit of Tom Sawyer and of Huckleberry Finn is due to his ability to recapture the temper of his own boyhood with its eagerness of self-assertion and with its youthful intolerance. As he wrote in a letter, given on page 566, I conceive that the right way to write a story for boys 
is to write so that it will not only interest boys but will also strongly interest any man who has ever been a boy that immensely enlarges the audience he was himself a man who could never forget that he had been a boy himself a man who could and did retain an ever fresh boyishness of outlook and of attitude it was perhaps this eternal boyishness which led him sometimes to answer a foolish or indiscreet letter with a volcanic frankness which relieved his own feelings at the time but which was entirely disproportionate to the offense he had received and it was his natural kindliness which induced him not to send this letter page four hundred and seventy five and to substitute for it a colorless and commonplace acknowledgment less likely to arouse sentiment now that i have endeavored to describe the house of fame that mr paine has erected to the memory of mark twain as a letter-writer it may be well for me to submit a few specimen bricks that the reader of this review may see for himself a little of the material out of which the stately edifice has been built here for example is a characteristic passage from a letter sent to helen keller when she had been annoyed by one of those futile and foolish accusations of plagiarism brought by somebody with a mania for uncovering mares nests oh dear me how unspeakably funny and owlishly idiotic and grotesque was that plagiarism farce as if there was much of anything in any human utterance oral or written except plagiarism the colonel the soul let us go further and say the substance the bulk the actual and valuable material of all human utterances is plagiarism for substantially all ideas are second-hand consciously and unconsciously drawn from a million outside sources and daily used by the garnerer with a pride and satisfaction born of the superstition that he originated them whereas there is not a rag of originality about them anywhere except the little discoloration they get from his mental and moral caliber and his temperament and which is revealed in characteristics of phrasing when a great orator makes a great speech you are listening to ten centuries and ten thousand men but we call it his speech and really some exceedingly small portion of it is his but not enough to signify missing text no doubt we are constantly littering our literature with disconnected sentences borrowed from books at some unremembered time and now imagine to be our own but that is about the most we can do in eighteen sixty six i read dr holmes poems in the sandwich islands a year and a half later i stole his dictation without knowing it and used it to dedicate my innocence abroad with then years afterward i was talking with dr holmes about it he was not an ignorant ass no not he he was not a collection of human turnips like your plagiarism court and so when i said i know now where i stole it but whom did you steal it from he said i don't remember i only know i stole it from somebody because i have never originated anything altogether myself nor met anybody who had rudyard kipling wrote to a friend that i love to think of the great and godlike clemens he is the biggest man you have on your side of the water by a damn sight and don't you forget it cervantes was a relative of his and when this was transmitted to mark he wrote 
it makes me proud and glad what kipling says i hope fate will fetch him to florence while we are there i would rather see him than any other man and earlier in the same acknowledgment mark had expressed his thanks for a volume of kipling's verse i have been reading the bell buoy and kipling's work and saving up the rest for other leisurely and luxurious meals a bell buoy is a deeply impressive fellow being in these many recent trips up and down the sound in the kanawa mr rogers yacht he talked to me nightly sometimes in his pathetic and melancholy way sometimes with his strenuous and urgent note and i got his meaning now i have his words no one but kipling could do this strong and vivid thing some day i hope to hear the poem chanted or sung with the bell buoy breaking out of the distance and here finally is part of the letter to me about sir walter scott i haven't been out of my bed for four weeks but well i have been reading a good deal and it occurs to me to ask you to sit down some time or other when you have eight or nine months to spare and jot me down a certain few literary particulars for my help and elevation your time need not be thrown away for at your further leisure you can make columbian lectures out of the results and do your students a good turn one are there in sir walter's novels passages done in good english english which is neither slovenly or involved two are there passages whose english is not poor and thin and commonplace but is of a quality above that three are there passages which burn with real fine not punk fox fire make believe four has he heroes and heroines who are not cads and caddises five has he personages whose acts and talk correspond with their characters as described by him six has he heroes and heroines whom the reader admires admires and knows why seven has he funny characters that are funny and humorous passages that are humorous eight does he ever claim the reader's interest and make him reluctant to lay the book down nine are there pages where he ceases from posing ceases from admiring the placid flood and flow of his own delusions ceases from being artificial and is for a time long or short recognizably sincere and in earnest ten did he know how to write english and didn't do it because he didn't want to eleven did he use the right word only when he couldn't think of any other one or did he run so much to wrong because he didn't know the right one when he saw it twelve can you read him and keep your respect for him of course a person could in his day an era of sentimentality and sloppy romantics but land can a body do it today end of section seventy four november eighteenth nineteen seventeen mark twain as a letter writer read by john greenman
Section 75 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 6, 1910 through 1919. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. February 11, 1918. Twain's Daughter Spurns Spirit Book. Mrs. Gabrilovich incensed by work attributed to her father by psychics. Will seek an injunction. Says she pronounced false data about which Dr. Hislop consulted her. Special to the New York Times, Philadelphia, February 10th. A revolutionary volume on modern science and philosophy, which the troubled spirit of Mark Twain is endeavoring to give the world through the medium of the American Society for Psychical Research, will never see the light of day if Mrs. Ossip Gabrilovich of Bryn Mawr, wife of the celebrated pianist and daughter of the great humorist, can prevent it. Announcement of the book which Twain is said to be trying to address to this unhappy civilization from that mystic realm beyond the grave is made by James H. Hislop in the January issue of the Journal of the Psychical Research Society. It seems that Professor Hislop and two women mediums, Mrs. Hayes of St. Louis and Mrs. Hutchings, have held frequent conversations with the spirit of Mark Twain, and have found the humorist in a state of intellectual torture because of the difficulty he is having in getting his momentous work into print. He is now greatly relieved because at last he has found a means of communication with the world which he was forced to leave before he had time to put the volume into writing. The great author is elated, Professor Hislop says, because what he has to say to the world will shed enlightenment where now there is only darkness and dismay. But Mrs. Gabrilovich, who before her marriage was Clara Clemens, is not impressed. In an interview today she unsympathetically characterized Professor Hislop's assertions as silly, foolish, stupid, and crazy, and announced that she has asked her attorney, Charles P. Lark of New York, to prevent the publication of the work through an injunction. While Professor Hislop was engaged in his so-called research work, said Mrs. Gabrilovich, he sent me many letters in which he asked me to confirm certain things which my father is supposed to have said to him. I answered a few of these letters, telling him that everything he had asked about was false, and finally the whole proceeding became so annoying I asked him not to write me any more. It was so silly and stupid that I decided I could not waste my time talking or writing about it. Then I placed the matter in the hands of my attorney, because I do not want any such book published. I suppose it would be harmless, but what would be the use of it? It is indescribably wild and foolish. I am sorry that even this preliminary announcement had to be made. In one letter the professor asked me if my father had seen a vision of his mother just before he died. I told him he had not, so far as I knew. In other communications he asked me about little personal things he is supposed to have found out, things concerning pictures, trinkets, and so forth, that my father is supposed to have owned. I found that I could not verify or confirm anything he had discovered, and at length I became weary of the matter. End of section 75, February 11, 1918, Twain's Daughter Spurns Spirit Book Read by John Greenman Section 76 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 6, 1910-1919. through 1919. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. February 12, 1918. Editorial. Annoying, but not dangerous. Anybody who is at all well-read in the literature of communications, ascribed to the spirits of departed notables, can easily understand why the daughter of Mark Twain grieves over the fact that a whole bookful of such messages from her distinguished father is soon to appear. It is not easy to see, however, just what she or others in like case can do to prevent the publication of such a volume. Unless it differs amazingly from all previous books of the same class, it will, indeed, demonstrate to all who accept the claims made as to its origin that habitation of the other world results in a pathetic deterioration of intelligence and a complete loss of the sense of humor. But there is no possibility of proving in court 
that such changes show the communications to be spurious whoever will can say they are what would be expected from the difficulties of transmission through an imperfect channel and that assertion puts an end to argument at any rate it leaves small chance for an appeal to the law for protection or redress it is much to be regretted that mark twain himself is precluded by circumstances from commenting on the forthcoming and very posthumous production the task is one that would have delighted him and its performance by him would delight everybody else except perhaps the psychical researchers who so industriously set down the products of subconscious activities his daughter should not be unduly disturbed her father's memory is safe no matter what nonsense the mediums say he makes them talk or write end of section seventy six february twelfth nineteen eighteen editorial annoying but not dangerous read by john greenman section seventy seven of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by John Greenman. June 9, 1918. Sue for Spirit Story. Harper's Ask for the Destruction of Mrs. Hutchings' Book. The alleged spirit story told by the late Samuel M. Sick Clemens to Mrs. Emily Grant Hutchings was the subject of a suit filed in the Supreme Court yesterday by Harper and Brothers who for seventeen years have had the sole rights to the mark twain stories against mrs hutchings and mitchell kennerly her publisher to restrain the sale of the book written by mrs hutchings and asking for the destruction of the books now on sale and an accounting of the sales to date the complaint states that mrs hutchings book jap heron purports to be a spirit communication in the form of a short story the announcement in the book concerning the alleged spirit story states that after several messages had been spelled out the pointer of the planchette traced the words samuel m sick clemens lazy sam and the story as printed was then told the complaint alleges that during the last seventeen years the harper house has published the mark twain works and during that time has distributed five hundred thousand circulars bearing his picture as a result of which he became more widely known than any other american not in public life it is alleged that mrs hutchings visited the harpers with the alleged spirit story in nineteen sixteen but they refused to publish it on the ground that it didn't emanate from mark twain and had no literary merit mrs hutchings has since induced mitchell kennerly to publish it End of section 77, June 9, 1918. Sue for Spirit Story. Read by John Greenman. Section 78 of Mark Twain in the New York Times, Part 6, 1910 through 1919. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by John Greenman. July 28, 1918 spiritualism in lawsuit case of harper and brothers against mitchell kennerly over copyright on mark twain's name on the face of it the suit of harper and brothers versus mitchell kennerly publisher involves a bald question of property right but by indirection it involves also the questions whether spirit communication with the living is demonstrable and whether there is a life hereafter the riddle of the universe is about to be debated not by theologians but by lawyers harper and brothers publishers of the works of samuel l clemens and owners of a copyright on the pen name mark twain base their action on the publication by mitchell kennerly of jap heron a novel which according to the introduction was communicated to mrs emily grant hutchings via the ouija board there is no direct statement that mark twain's spirit dictated the book he is not named as author and on this technicality the attorneys for mr kennerly might possibly seek to evade trial but james n rosenberg who has been retained by the defendant publishers said the other day that the case would be tried on its merits 
we will put the issue up to the supreme court he asserted we will have a final ruling on immortality has the shade of samuel clemens any right to the use of a pseudonym he adopted in the flesh and permitted his publishers to copyright what claims have the departed on the relics of their earthly pilgrimage these are obvious issues in the suit and if it is established to the satisfaction of the court that the spirit of mark twain did indeed communicate the novel while the attorneys for the plaintiff are upheld in their contention that said spirit had no right to market any literary commodities except through the house of harpers owing to a contract made prior to his passing by what mode of procedure can the disembodied be brought to book for such unbusinesslike not to say immoral conduct william marion reedy of st louis who had a part in making the work of patience worth another ouija board authoress known to the material world had a finger in this occult concoction too emily grant hutchings had known mr reedy for some time she had contributed special articles to his magazine the mirror but mr reedy confesses he did not think much of her as a fiction writer about three years ago she asked him to read some manuscript she had with her he did and he was surprised at its worth at that time the novel jap heron was about half finished mrs hutchings said nothing to mr reedy about how she had written it but during the course of an evening at her home the ouija board was produced and mrs hutchings and mrs hayes who sat with her during the readings began to work with it either that or it was moved by the spirit controlling it mr reedy was surprised to find that he was reading a continuation of the unfinished manuscript he had recently seen it was then he learned that mark twain was declared to be dictating the story mr reedy was in town the other day and when he was asked whether he thought jap heron came up to mark twain's standard he was in doubt parts of it are good as typical of mark twain as i can remember from my early readings he said but other parts are sloppy awfully sloppy and, and sweet and sentimental usual best-seller stuff harper and brothers assert in their petition that jap heron is far below the grade of anything mark twain wrote while alive and that the circulation of the book would hurt his reputation among the points harper and brothers will present are the two books mark twain wrote what is man and the mysterious stranger in which he asserted that there was no such thing as life after death he refused to believe in a spirit world he refused to be a spook judge or jury must weigh that fact but it is possible that the ouija board will be made to perform in court and that the shade of mark twain or what purports to be his spirit will undertake to confound mark twain the unbeliever that mrs hutchings intends to get into communication with that very important witness is an assured point in her introduction to the book she shows that she and mark twain are on the friendliest terms he calls her emily and she calls him mark there is nothing spooky about their conversation it does not smack of the spiritist cabinet while the book was being revised the ouija board has occasion to chafe mr hutchings who was acting for his wife in secretarial capacity smoke up and cool off old boy the spook is reported as saying to mr hutchings perhaps i should apologize the last secretary i had used to wear an ice-soaked towel the girls mrs hutchings and mrs hayes and old mark together will make the riffle well we will slow up in my ambition i have been too eager it is hard to explain how great a thing is the power to project my mentality through the clods of oblivion i have so long sought for an opening be patient please i am not carping i get edwin's mr hutchings position we will be easy with the new saddle so the nag won't run away i heard edwin's suggestion and it is a good one we will go straight through the story beginning where we left off tonight that was what i intended to do but that second chapter nipped me 
there is of course ground for doubt whether the testimony transmitted through a ouija board will be accepted the court may consider it incompetent irrelevant and immaterial but if it is admitted the stenographer's transcript is likely to have a liveliness uncommon in court procedure end of section seventy eight july twenty eighth nineteen eighteen spiritualism in lawsuit read by john greenman section seventy nine of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman september fifteenth nineteen eighteen to aid artists affected by war an organization called the artists war service league is being founded here for the benefit of artists of all professions who have been wounded or incapacitated during the war mark twain's home in redding connecticut has been offered by his daughter madame gabrilovich as a convalescent home the initial membership committee is composed of such artists as rudyard kipling enrico caruso daniel c french and john drew membership will be open not only to professional people but to all lovers of the arts end of section seventy nine september fifteenth nineteen eighteen to aid artists affected by war read by john greenman section eighty of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman october twenty fifth nineteen eighteen twain home a rest camp stormfield estate to be a retreat for wounded men stormfield the estate at redding connecticut which was the home of mark twain has been given by his daughter clara clemens madame ossip gabrilovich for the use of convalescent soldiers and sailors of the artistic professions madame gabrilovich though admitting that she had turned stormfield over for the use of wounded men would not discuss the subject further saying that the affairs of the organization which was to control the estate were not yet complete end of section eighty october twenty fifth nineteen eighteen twain home a rest camp read by john greenman section eighty one of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman november seventh nineteen eighteen stormfield for a home clara clemens gabrilovich aids artists war service clara clemens gabrilovich has turned over stormfield the home of mark twain at redding connecticut as a convalescent home in charge of the artists war service league recently incorporated under the laws of the state of new york the objects of this organization are similar to those of the american friends of musicians in france except that it proposes to aid men of all the artistic professions in the service and their dependents instead of confining itself to musicians alone an honorary committee named for the purpose of stimulating membership now includes rudyard kipling representing literature enrico caruso music daniel c french sculpture and john drew representing the drama j f d lanier will be treasurer and winslow lanier and company will act as bankers for the fund raised by the league end of section eighty one november seventh nineteen eighteen stormfield for a home read by john greenman section eighty two of mark twain in the new york times part six nineteen ten through nineteen nineteen this librivox recording is in the public domain read by john greenman december twenty third nineteen nineteen mark twain's home sold hartford residence built in eighteen seventy wrote huckleberry finn there hartford connecticut december twenty second the hartford home of samuel l clemens mark twain at three hundred and fifty one farmington avenue where tom sawyer and huckleberry finn were written was sold today by richard m bissell president of the hartford fire insurance company 
to j j and i ahern of this city the house was built by mr clemens in 1870 and until a few months ago was used as a private school end of section 82 december 23rd 1910 mark twain's home sold and end of mark twain in the new york times part 6 1910 through 1919 read by john greenman